Hi, everybody. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I am executive director at All Brains Belong. Um, I run this organization, but I cannot appoint anyone co-host. So anyway, um, technology thwarts me constantly. Um, I'm so glad you're all here for a really important brain club. We are going to be discussing the findings from the Learning from Actually Autistic Health Narrative study. Um, we are joined by um, the research team from the University of Vermont um, and uh, the reflections from this team um, in my mind are truly um, like, like truly put into perspective for me, um, the really an illustrate the double empathy problem, which is um, when doctors and patients, let alone people with mixed neurotype, just like people who have a mismatch of communication style and worldview, um, the impact on health of that problem. Tonight's Brain Club is offered with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration of the U.S. Department of Health under the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health grant and through the generosity of so many of you. Um, if you're new to Brain Club, just to orient you, um, ABB's uh, weekly, very intentionally created education program for purposes of providing education about ABB's approach to neuroinclusive community culture. Brain Club is a program designed to bring people together uh, based on a shared vision and promoting new ways of thinking and being with the idea that then we go out into the rest of our lives um, and that's how we collectively change the world. This is a place to feel safe, a place to experience how culture can be different. It's a place to collectively learn and unlearn together. And although All Brains Belong has a variety of types of programs, uh, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group. Um, this is an education program um, uh, where we invite you to explore today's big picture themes and share ideas or reflections related to tonight's topic of discussion. All paths to participation are okay and welcome here. You can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those other neuronormative constructs. Please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or whatever else needs doing. Um, we have pre-recorded tonight's panel, uh, which will take up uh, almost the entirety of tonight's Spring Club. We may have some, maybe uh, some time, a few minutes for questions at the end. So don't wait for the end. Please ask your questions or make your comments in the chat as we go, if you'd like to. Um, observation, of course, is a valid form of participation. <laughs> Um, and in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make this safe for all participants, uh, we do prioritize the group's collective needs over that of the individual. So just being mindful of language used and being mindful of, of access needs. Access needs being anything that anyone requires for full and meaningful participation. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. Um, uh, and, and access needs can be, you know, so many different things from physical, emotional, communication related, um, and the type of access needs um, that uh, that I'll that I'll come up relating to technology. So, um, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So, depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. That's my visual support to actually open the chat. Um, speaking of the chat, often we have conflicting access needs and the chat. Although the chat um, is an important um, strategy for many people to be able to access this program, it's a way of communicating without mouth words. It's a way of getting your thoughts out as soon as they pop up. You don't have to burden working memory. Um, it allows for more processing time. It allows for um, you know, being able to think about something and, and, and share your thoughts you know, 10 minutes later when, when it comes to you. At the same time, uh, the, the chat is also um, uh, causes trouble for, for lots of other people um, where it may feel visually cluttered or distracting. 
Some people even have a, a startle response when the chat pops up, especially when it pops up quickly. So some of the ways that we suggest navigating this conflicting access need problem um, is that if you are someone for whom the chat bothers you, um, after the first pop-up, try not closing the window. Leave it open so the text will, will change, but it won't pop anymore. It'll just pop once. You can also try disabling chat preview by clicking on the little up arrow next to the chat on your toolbar, and it'll show show, uh, show chat previews with a checkbox. You can click it and make the checkbox go away, and then hopefully the, the pop-ups won't happen. The other thing, if you are a chat user, we ask that you just put your comments like in the regular chat and try not to use the threads or the replies because that um, actually makes like popping happen more because it's popping up and down um, every time someone replies. So just use the regular, like the, the, ma the, main, the main box of the chat. Conflicting access needs. So it's June, welcome to June. Our new month has a new theme. Small changes, big impact. Um, with the idea of all of the different realms where that is true. In, um, including next week. Next week, we have a special event. Um, uh, I, I, we never know how many people are going to come. Uh, we know we have, we have, we have uh, you know, close to 200 people signed up, but we never know who's going to come. Um, but so so it, it won't be a regular brain club. It'll take place during the slot of brain club, but it's um, our, our webinar, Practical Strategies for Neuroinclusive Healthcare, where we'll talk about the very specific things that we do here. Hopefully there'll be some healthcare providers to learn um, how to deliver and adapt uh, healthcare delivery, deliver neuroinclusive healthcare, but also very specific things that patients can learn to then go ask for in the settings where they get healthcare. Um, again, trying to bridge the double empathy problem. So our topic tonight, I do want to give a content warning that we are talking about healthcare experiences. And for many people, this is really distressing um, uh, that, that you'll hear about um, uh, uh, trauma, ableism, medical post-traumatic stress disorder. What we know is that Neurodivergent people often struggle to access healthcare. Um, we know that um, uh, autistic and ADHD people, um, we know in the literature and in the and, and, and in our day to day lives, um, uh, struggle with higher rates of untreated medical problems, higher rates of chronic illness, um, and in particular, um, suffer from a constellation of intertwined medical problems um, that the traditional healthcare system does not. Um, always understand very well, um, and uh, the healthcare system interferes with clinicians being able to manage this constellation um, as a unified entity, as opposed to like fragmenting out the body parts and trying to make them fit into a 10 to 15 minute visit. Um, so um, I'm going to, um, oh, that's amazing, Tracy, that's great. Um, Examples of what goes into this constellation, this is not an, an exhaustive list by any means, but hypermobility, um, dysautonomia, mast cell disease, uh, fibromyalgia, um, intestinal problems, sleep problems, like a whole bunch of things. They're all part of this unified constellation um, that in our medical practice, 97% of our autistic and ADHD adult patients have this constellation, um, 97%. So um, I, I, I provide this background information, um, uh, uh, by the way, um, it, it, Sarah, if you can pop this in the chat uh, for anybody who wants to learn more about this constellation, um, there's tons, tons of education materials available at, at, at uh, the Everything's Connected to Everything, Improving the Healthcare of Autistic and ADHD Adults website. Um, I've mentioned a few times now the double empathy problem. So this is a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who is an autistic social scientist in the UK, who, as I said before, um, communication breakdowns happen when there is a mismatch of worldview and communication style. And in healthcare, double empathy problem all day long. Doctors and patients often do not speak one another's language. And um, this, this causes um, really negative health impact um, and uh, really um, for many people uh, the experience of feeling dismissed, invalidated, even traumatized in their healthcare experiences. 
So um, really, really excited um, to uh, be learning today uh, from uh, the research team from the University of Vermont, Dr. Laura Lewis, um, and two of her research team members, um, Sarah Knudsen and Zeff. Um, we are going to be um, uh, playing this video, um, and Dr. Lewis is going to introduce the study um, at the beginning of the video to tell you about what this research is. Um, and then uh, for the next 44 minutes, um, you'll get to see the research team debrief um, what this study showed. I'm going to share screen again with the video. Hi, I'm Laura Lewis. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an associate professor of nursing at the University of Vermont. And I was the principal investigator on this study, meaning that I was the lead researcher. Um, so this study we came up with in collaboration with Dr. Hauser to look at the constellation of intertwined medical problems that we've been calling all the things and um, start to look at what it's like for people who are living with all the things. So we used a participatory action approach, meaning that we had community members and autistic people on our research team. Um, we had a really great team where we're really lucky and we met to go over from the very beginning of the study, what it was gonna look like, what our research materials would look like, what our participants would actually see and what kind of questions we would ask them. Um, and then our community partners were with us all the way through data collection and data analysis. So uh, really interpreting the findings that we had and understanding and making sense of the data that we collected. Um, so we interviewed using um, online methods and like virtual interviews. We ended up doing 30 interviews with autistic adults who had at least three um, health conditions or health concerns. Um, and those could be self-identified. They didn't have to be formally diagnosed by a provider. Um, and then we took those stories and we really tried to make sense of um, what those experiences were like for people and take away some findings that might support um, clinicians trying to care for autistic adults um, that are experiencing multiple health concerns um, and hopefully also support autistic adults themselves in making sense of their health experiences. How many people experience something physiologic in response to something that happens and they go in and they tell their doctor and i think what the what the participants in this study said um is that the doctor did or said something that led the person to conclude this person does not believe me like that, if I were gonna sum up like the whole thing and pick one thing, like, so just for professionals to be aware that this is like a widespread national trend that autistic people are coming in and describing what's going on in their bodies and they're having the experience of something that the professional is doing and saying that results in them feeling not believed. What do y'all think about that? So I'm gonna go ahead and go if that's okay. Um, and it ties in really well with the example that we were just talking about, my nausea, because um, it typically, what typically happens is over the summer, I wind up having a really bad time with nausea. When I've gone in and talked with my doctor about it, the medical assistant would like brush it off saying, you know, you were doing a lot of gardening last week. And I'm sitting here going, no, this is a long-term issue. This has been happening periodically for years. Trying to have a conversation with a provider who is hearing my communications at an acute level rather than understanding that there is a very long-term pattern associated with this. And even when the long-term pattern was identified, nothing was done about it. Classic example, I'm so sorry that that 
happened. I feel like one of the things that really stood out to me in a lot of these stories about like being believed or not believed was like, I f felt like as a nurse, there have been times that I've like, even in some of these transcripts, I read things that didn't match what I learned in nursing school about the way that something works or the way that the body functions. And it, it triggered something in me that, that thank goodness for this team, I feel like we had a, a chance to unpack um, where I felt, I felt myself have a sense of like, well, that's not how that works. And I feel like what this team brought to light in a huge way is the importance of understanding and making space for realities that may not match your own experience um, or the way that we've been taught to understand a, a body system or how something works. Um, and, and that really is to me bridging the double empathy problem. And I think the other piece that came out of this was so many people talked about not having words or language for their experience. And so they did the best they could to get that language so that they could bring it to a provider, but they didn't have like years of medical school to interpret and understand the language fully. So then when they brought that into a provider, they may have used a phrase differently or used a different word or something that wouldn't match the provider's perception of how that's supposed to look. And it may have ultimately thwarted their efforts of trying to communicate with a provider where then the provider may have dismissed it because it didn't logically match the provider's understanding of that same content. Um, and that was something that was really interesting for me from a healthcare lens and how we make sense of what patients tell us. I'm just struck with what Zuff says also in, um, and I don't know, I don't know how to bridge this with providers or, or not because but but that that challenge between the the providers focus on the acute thing and also their assumption that you know there's uh, there's also this assumption that I don't know much about my body and so they're explaining to me this thing on a really simplistic ter terms that I've like already thought about a hundred times and ruled out and so it's already an immediate disconnect between me and the provider that they're 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 telling me something that you know i if it was the first time i was seeing somebody about this issue it might be interesting information for me to test out but by now i've heard it 20 times and rejected it 20 times and been in pain about it 20 times um about it not working for me and 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 so this is a, a that, that what i'm bringing to you is like a long-term issue of how do i understand like why this thing started for me 20 or 30 years ago and why it's still going on now and why my body's still behaving the way it is and what I can do about it that um, obviously is not going to be like this short-term fix because it's been going on for 20 or 30 years. But clearly there's something that I that's not been right between me and my body for you know, three decades and now, and, and what, how do I change that relationship? Because I don't have a clue. And then I, and then I get a simplistic term from my provider and I go, oh, fucking, they don't have a clue either. <laughs> Sarah, what you just said made me wonder something else. Like you said, well, I'm, I'm seeking an understanding, right? Like I don't, I, I wonder how often clinicians and patients understand each other's goals for an interaction right so um i think particularly in a medical system where the clinician doesn't have their access needs met they don't have a framework for that at all to begin with but they're like um dysregulated um over you know overburdened over drained um and there is this feeling this limbic feel, reaction to the idea that, that that somebody wants something somebody wants something of me from me um and and often it's it's just not based in reality the provider is not necessarily able to take in information about like actually somebody just really wants to have a conversation sometimes about how this could be we're not at a place where we're talking about is this happening Right, like we skip that part because the patient said it's happening. That's what's happening in their body. You get to actually skip that part. Like it, you, the patient wasn't actually asking, is this happening? It is happening. 
right? And so if you are like at this place where the encounter becomes, well, is this happening? Um, and I think that like acute care is very much about, is this happening, right? So I have this thing, do I have this acute process? And there are tests and there are, you know, imaging and there are this and there are that, like, like, like you, you're, it's like a, you're testing for a particular thing. And if that thing is happening, you can maybe find a thing. When we're really talking about the chronic health conditions, the constellation of intertwined medical problems that autistic people commonly experience, we're not in that model. And I don't know right. that anybody's naming that. Right. Yeah, I think that's so true, Mel. I, I, I think it's the, the, the question is, is, is more of a, a and, and it's like something is happening. I might not have enough information to understand what is happening, but something is happening. There's something hap in the relationship with me and my, uh, the, between my body and me that isn't working, that hasn't been working for a long time. I don't know how to fix it. And I need enough information. I need to understand what's going on in order to be even begin to figure out how to fix it. And if you're not going to help me understand what's going on, if you're just going to say, well, I can slap, I, I can put a, I can, I can throw a, a, a pill at this and then you won't notice it happening. That's not what I'm looking for. I mean, it's just like, that's, I, I, I want to know why this happens every time I garden. <laughs> um and uh, or wh why this happens like every time i go to a family reunion i need three weeks to recover and i can't get out of bed for the first three days and i can barely feed my cat and um you know you know it's just like why what and what can i do differently or do i just it, it, you know, it, is there a way is there hope to change this relationship with my body that clearly isn't working and that's sort of the desperation the level of desperation that I'm in. And the doctor's like, and yet it in a totally different way. It's it feels to me like a lot of those issues are also compounded by this, like we have these diagnostic tests and for a lot of autistic folks, the results of that test may not align with what we expect to see in the results of those tests from medical knowledge or nursing knowledge or healthcare knowledge. And it seems like we have this like, this huge trust in these objective tests that we have over somebody's yeah objective <laughs> tests that we have over somebody's experience and what they're telling us and it seems like for a lot of people when the test is negative that's the end so it does not exist to the provider anymore and we no longer care about really trying to support your symptoms or your experience or um, whatever you need support with because the test was negative yeah. Right. And so in the setting of this constellation of intertwined neuroimmune conditions, like, you know, when we order tests at All Brains Belong, for example, we, we try to like really over the top counsel patients like we're expecting these tests to not show anything. There are not good tests that are going to show us stuff. When we find something like I'm going to celebrate because I've got like a very clear thing that we've identified, you know, we found, you know, your B12 deficiency, or we found your thyroid thing or, or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean even if it came back normal, it doesn't mean you don't have either of those things or any of the other things that go into this constellation. And that's not something that um, most healthcare professionals get any training in, that they have any frame of reference for that they would believe is true, but it is true, you know, Got I hope practice for the practice. You all. I think um, for a lot of the participants in, in this study, people talked about providers just sort of writing things off as being a weight-related issue. Um, and the same was true for mental health, that if somebody went in with a known mental health diagnosis, it automatically put the provider in this context of like, well, that's your mental health and no longer seeking another layer of what's going on with this person. And we saw that a lot, both weight and mental health being these sort of distracting pieces of a conversation that weren't really relevant from the person's experience, um, but to the provider became just the answer in the end of the conversation. And, and Zeph's got a hand up, and then I've got a thought on this, too. Yeah, I was just going to say that I don't think my concerns about 
the weight loss were taken seriously because I am obese. And I also wonder if, like, these, like, both what we're calling weight weight issues and, and what we're calling what we're calling obesity and what and what we're calling um, mental health issues aren't inextricably intertwined with the physical like with 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 some other kind of with with a condition that is that is physiological that is not showing up on tests that and and so that that, that these things are all, these things are they're they're a sign that that they're they're a sign to look deeper and that and that our medical knowledge needs to go deeper that we're not we're missing something and there's something that we're not understanding about the way that both appetite and um and 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 the and physio physio physiology of retaining of of you know caloric energy processing um is literally um is is somehow is somehow not is there isn't working in in a, in a human body and, and and how that affects both uh mood and um and 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 other aspects of of cognitive functioning that then we then we just write off as well it's mental health when when in fact we when in fact the moment we see mental health we ought to be we ought to be saying we, we, we ought to be saying oh my god there's there's something going there there's we're, we're, there's something happening and come at that from a little bit of the opposite direction just to show the diversity of what happens out there but when i started when my symptoms of the functional neurological disorder started getting more extreme i was talking with my mental health provider and she was one of the people who really supported me in saying that yes there really is something going on with your body um i saw my first neurologist regarding some of these issues in 2016 and i was told i was diagnosed with cptsd and no treatment except for sending me to the local mental health center which was not prepared to deal with me um, moved out to Vermont, wound up seeing two neurologists. The first one diagnosed it as functional neurological disorder and told me to get counseling. So it's, 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 it's like this concept that mental health and physical health are in some ways separate. It's just so bogus. And this combination of all the things that would impact the nervous system medications, supplements, adapting your environment and routines, nutrition, like, I mean, it's, it, it, it's like everything. But that's, I think if we could just, um, if it would be all right to like even circle back to the, like, you know, so we've got these big picture problems in the discipline of medicine or the domain of, of, of healthcare. Um, but if we can circle back to the, the things that doctors, say and do that is unhelpful can we name some of those things that that have have come up in in in, in the research Laura is anything coming to mind of some of the some of the things that people talked about because I think people have no idea I think they'd be like I think they would be surprised to be told that when they say oh you, you're suffering and I make a comment right away about your weight like that they'd be surprised to hear that that's not helpful and that that's harmful and that that's invalidating and that is resulting in the patient feeling bad i think they would be surprised to hear that yeah and i think one that came up for a lot of people was um that they felt that they had a need for information that was underestimated by the provider and so if they said to the provider you know i'm really concerned about um this this piece of my health um somebody talked for example about like um their height was changing and i don't remember if it was getting taller or shorter but they were like why is this happening what's going on with my body and the provider's like well i wouldn't worry about that and that was the end of it and so it immediately gave the impression that the provider didn't care about them or something that was important to them was immediately dismissed in their care. Um, and I feel like those were the kind of things that we were seeing where people really had this interest in wanting to know more about their bodies and wanting to learn what was going on with themselves and why they were having an experience. And when providers 
I think from the from the nursing end, I suspect that many providers thought that that would be helpful and reducing anxiety and just telling you not to worry about that. And really what it was doing was explaining or not explaining, but showing people I don't really care about that without giving any explanation for why they're not concerned or what they suspect is going on that makes them immediately not concerned. Um, and that was something we saw for a lot of people. And the interpretation was, my provider lacks curiosity. They're not trying to figure out the problem. They don't actually care about me. They don't believe me. Um, when I suspect on the provider end, it was actually meant to be a reassurance, but it certainly wasn't. I mean, that happens with so many things. Um, and I think that even, even um, I, I was talking with someone yesterday about, you know, why do, why do providers tell parents who are wondering if their children are autistic um, why, why, why do, why do providers tell parents like, oh, you know, don't worry, like, w that's implying there's something to worry about, like, how about we just try to understand how, how my sweet little love's brain works, right, so. Often, it, the, the things that are, are most, that hurt the most are, are like, I'll, I'll go in and I'll talk about something and they'll like, so are you, are you following up with your therapist, are you, are are you are you are you taking your medications? Are you doing, um, and, and so, and so it's like they're far more concerned. What that what I what, what I'm hearing them saying is, are, are they're far more concerned about anything that's going on with me, mental health wise, than physical, and the, and also that they're they're not going to try very hard to do anything to that to, to they're not going to be looking very closely or trying very hard because because they're already they've already drawn the conclusion that whatever's happening with me mental health wise is far more important than anything they can possibly see physically. Um, and, and so our concerns aren't aligned. Um, and I, I, and I also think that there's something about that, that, that piece that's very much re reminiscent of what I get as an autistic person in the culture at large, um, my communicate it, it, it's it's very. I don't. I'm not quite sure what. It's not so much. Don't. It, it's that. It's that the things that I'm concerned about are the things I zoom in on, uh, or, or and maybe it's that I'm more detail oriented than the culture at large. Or, 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 or I guess it, no. It reminis It's reminiscent of what I see about social patterns where people are trying to be. You know, I'm worried about how did I come across to somebody or I'm worried about some social energy that I'm picking up on and the person's going, don't worry about that. It's not a problem. It's not an issue. And then three, you know, and, and then three months later, the person, the, the the thing that I was worried about is blown up and I'm fired from a job or and the person's not talking to me or, you know, so so the, the, doc, the provider is really d doing like they're providing a reassurance that I have learned not to trust um, because it it doesn't like. What what other people think isn't worrisome, um, I have learned is actually worrisome from from a point of my survival socially. And then and 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 then when it blows up, I also get blamed because you know obviously there must be something that was wrong because nobody else saw it coming, you know. Um, and so uh, anyway, so uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, that's really important and really important that we name that when someone says that they are concerned about something and the professional, um, uh, you, you name two things. So one, um, anything pertaining to a lens of mental health is, per, it, it is implying to the person that you are not thinking about the rest of their physical health because it's already been made really clear that you're thinking about those things separately. Um, and I, I would imagine that what what uh, related to that would be um, how many people told us um, that their provider talks about, well, tell me about your stress, like talking about stress. I mean, like, yes, we are impacted by physiologic stress from, you know, even, you know, physically exerting ourselves. Our mitochondria aren't using energy appropriately. But anyway, like, don't like like stress has connotations and those it's, it's like greatly implied that you're you know, not not aligned, as I think as I think Sarah said really well. Laura, what were you going to say? Well, I think the other thing that you touched on when you started that, Sarah, is 
questioning your com your compliance with the treatment plan and that the questions yeah. become about like well are you taking the meds and almost this questioning of what you're reporting as being the problem is the way you're doing the treatment plan not that the treatment plan doesn't work for you um or or that we're looking in the wrong direction and i think that we saw a lot of that in our interviews too that people really felt like those those hard questions like not hard questions but the continual questioning of whether you were following things in the correct way. And it comes back to Sarah, that blame piece that it ultimately is on you, the way that you were following the plan is the problem instead of the plan is the problem. There's, they're assuming if I comply, that the problem is, is, is one thing. And if I comply with this certain part of the treatment plan, all my problems get rosy and better. My life experience is saying, no, the treatment plan is like what you've named the treatment plan is is inadequate or at least i'm not buying into it because i i don't understand why why it would work for me it doesn't make sense to me in terms of what i perceive to be going on in my body and you're not helping me make the links the person who could possibly help me make the links as to why these two things would fit together and why why these unanswered questions would get answered in this mental health treatment plan and well, Sarah, I think one of the things that we also kept hearing and that we talked a lot about is that when people became more resistant to that treatment plan because it wasn't working for them, because it was painful for them or worsened symptoms or was, you know, expensive and didn't meet their needs or whatever that looked like, the participants often felt coerced into doing that plan and comments like, well, if you really wanted to get better, this is what you would do. And so then yeah. it became this like bad patient for not following a plan that really people knew in their guts wasn't helpful for them and in many ways was harmful for them. Yeah. Um, and, and then sort of this cycle happening of becoming more resistant, becoming frustrated, becoming angry, feeling more resistant, feeling more skeptical, and then being perceived by the provider as being like uncompliant, uncooperative, and all those difficult words. Yeah. Yeah. I know this um, when someone is viewing you through a lens, that deficit based lens that includes like you are difficult, you are doing it wrong, there's something wrong with you, that is perceived by the person's nervous system. I think that professionals don't realize that when you're not viewing another human in, with unconditional positive regard, the interaction is different. Yeah. Plus you layer on that we are talking about um, a population that has experienced significant trauma physiology, right? So as a neurodivergent person growing up in a world that is not designed with you in mind, where you, you know, you, you, like, 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 let alone that maybe you didn't, you know, have any framework for understanding what was happening. You have these chronic health conditions and the lived experience of being dismissed and invalidated and told you're too much, you're worrying about the wrong things, the thing you think's important doesn't matter. Like that's been, that's the lived experience of a lot of people. So you come in and it, the, the provider doesn't even need to say anything. If they think that energetically, the patient feels it. Mel, our ultimate takeaway from this study, I would say is that people went into a provider to seek help for something going on and they left feeling like they now had two problems. The first being the same problem they went in with to begin with, and the second being the added stress and burden of being invalidated and dismissed and gaslit. And um, it seemed like in many ways, the healthcare experience for a lot of folks that we talked to only added to their poor health that they were already experiencing and to the burden of the, the problems that they initially were seeking help for. I can tell you what I have at the bottom of this, like um, I have here that the transformative flipped script is feeling like my experiences are heard and understood. And even if you can't help me understanding my experiences holistically and believing my lived experience of my body can support my health by at least removing the psychological burden of feeling like my experiences are invalid and defy logic. 
I don't know if that's a helpful way to end it is like that positive note of that there is a different version of this that's possible when people are believed and understood for what they're bringing to the table um, that even if we don't have the medical tools to make the problems better that we can alleviate some of the suffering and the burden of what people are experiencing it's really rare as an autistic person to be viewed as a person to be seen and treated as a person period in our society even among peers but then when you add to that people who who have power to say whether something exists or doesn't exist it's it's um it's 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 even probably it's even probably rarer and and so probably the most the the, the most healthful thing um and, and and to the extent that like so much of what perhaps goes on with me is the reflection of like the trauma of living in a culture that 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 dismisses and undermines my humanity at every turn the fact that there's someone that that there's a clinician who has uh, who, someone who has an incredible amount of power who treats me as a human being and who takes what i'm saying seriously and who's willing to try to align with me to get that has to support me to get answers to to, to questions that i that i that i don't understand I mean that in and of itself is uh, even even if that in and of itself is 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 um, potentially curative. I mean that in and of itself is potentially changing the 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 uh, how support helping to reverse the the oh, as this is this probably going to sound woo woo, but sort of the energy dynamics that have gone on in my body between me and the culture. I mean, if you just if you just think of the stress of living in a culture and what your body has to do to adjust to living in a culture where that wants to throw you out at every turn and that, that wants to throw out your personhood, the stamp over it uh, and to and to have somebody who is a power who's powerful, who's succeeding in the culture, who has a voice in the culture, actually say that they're your ally and they're going to help you to get to the bottom of what's going on that and in and, and your in in your in in your body and 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 not throw you out in the way that uh, that you expect to be thrown out that in and of itself is the beginning of healing it's the the human the, the human relationship is where the healing starts and doctors think it, that the healing starts at the medical relationship, but with autistic people who have been and, and 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 other people who are generally seen as powerless in the culture, the place where the healing relationship starts is not with the good is not with what you consider good medicine. It's with what you consider it's with what people would consider like respectful personhood. It's like seeing another person as a person. And, and that's where the healing starts. And until that starts, there is no health. It's like until, until I, I start to be seen and feel about myself as a person vis-a-vis -vis other people in the culture that I'm living in and as a medical doctor, you're a symbol of that. Until I start to see myself as that, there is no healing. That is the healing is not, my body it doesn't, isn't resourced to heal. There's just too much stress and too many factors against me. Thank you for naming that. I also think that part of healing right, is, is taking a look at that power dynamic. So I I think, Sarah, 
I mean, everything you just said was so powerful and, 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 And I kept hearing you say, uh, uh, but but the, the power dynamic part. I think we should include that in this, right? Because if a doctor patient, a clinician patient interaction with inherent power imbalance, I think that is something that really bears further reflection right so i i i i think that if the clinician has the mindset that i am the expert in the thing you have how does that not impact the interaction if instead a clinician would recognize that the patient is the expert in what's going on in their body. The, whatever they're experiencing and whatever is communicated, that's what it is. Like, that's what it is. If that is acknowledged, then it's about like, yeah, I have some skills. I have some tools. Uh, let me share them with you and see if any of them are a fit for you. But like that, this business of I am expert, I am here to fix and change and cure. I, I think that's not helpful. I think we also saw a lot of gatekeeping happening with that power dynamic where if exactly what you're saying doesn't fit exactly what this textbook says this condition looks like, then I'm going to withhold that diagnosis from you. And what a lot of people talked about was the power of a diagnosis, um, both in like social validation of their experience when they can go and tell other people if they choose to that. I have X and, and that sort of takes away the need to explain and give a list of symptoms and a reason why they don't have a diagnosis and all these other pieces. Um, and it also, in many cases, gave some direction to a plan, um, like just having a name for what I'm living felt so powerful to a lot of people. Um, and Mel, you had said, I wrote this down in a previous meeting, that doctors are trained in shared decision making, but not in shared diagnosis making. And I think that was something that stood out to me because for so many people, they wanted to be a part of naming what was going on with them and, and uh, giving that information that they had as the expert of what it was. Um, and, and they were left out of that and ignored in that process. And, and I think that part of shared diagnosis making um, involves like an awareness and a, a transparency around the limitations of the diagnostic tools, right? So um, if I were evaluating someone for mast cell dis um, activation disorder, I, I have this awareness that the tests are bad tests, that, you know, you have to be in a big flare, you have to have the lab test drawn in the middle of a big flare, um, it, the, 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 the specimen has to be collected and spun in a cold centrifuge and like it can't be on out in room temperature for more than a few minutes because it disintegrates like and so mostly labs are not following that right so I have to know all that in order to know that your pattern is telling me that you have mast cell dysfunction I can tell you that like probably those tests are going to come back normal but that doesn't mean you don't have this um, and so while I might not you know if I like want to be consistent and follow the documentation of like what the medical gatekeeping thing is like fine I'm, I'm gonna say you have mast cell dysfunction and not mast cell activation disorder um but i'm gonna like be transparent about that like it's not because you don't have this or it's the idea that you know if you meet criteria for hypermobile ehlers-danlos syndrome um there's not actually a difference in how we approach that as appears to if you don't meet criteria and you have hypermobility spectrum disorder like we're still going to approach this the same um and and i but, but people don't know and like professionals don't know enough about these conditions and they're common they're common everyday conditions and in fact like the things that cl clinicians do know are common um like diabetes like in our practice of mostly autistic and adhd adults Every single human with diabetes and prediabetes has 
the constellation of neuroimmune conditions. Every single one. So we have this thing that traditional medicine says is common, and yet it is completely not known. This major big deal that contributes to that. Mel, one of the things that we talked about early on in this project was this idea of like population health and sort of making judgments about the person in front of you based on a population. And we were sort of like coming at this like anti-population health lens a little bit. And one of the things that you said that I thought was really powerful was that it's not that you can't use population health, it's that we're misidentifying the population that's in front of us. So we're making assumptions about a broader population and applying it to a subpopulation when there are separate assumptions we need to make about this subpopulation, perhaps. Then that? This is, uh, I don't remember saying anything so it's, that's a really astute observation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's the reason why the diagnostics are so important because even just getting a diagnosis of autism puts you into that population because autism is so invisible otherwise. I mean, I saw doctors for 50 years and no one said anything to me about autism. Zeph, that's really important, right? Because so one, one, one of the things that people who like, you know, don't get their medical care here, you know, like people on social media, they'll reach out like, how do I get this? I'm like, well, you, you know, print out the tool from the All of Things project and bring it into your doctor and, you know, that, that whole thing. But if they don't know, if the doctor doesn't know that they are autistic or ADHD, the doctor won't know that this tool applies to them. Right. So it's like it's like the gatekeeping entry into the subpopulation that maybe we have a chance for the professional to match. Because I think that a lot of professionals would say like, no, I don't actually know anything about autistic adults. Teach me. Sure, I'll learn. Um, uh, it's, it's the um, lack of recognition about how many autistic adults there are. They may not even know it. Exactly. Exactly. So that's another thing that I think is really important because here we are, we have um, a, a subpopulation that the doctor doesn't know and the patient doesn't know, right? They just are suffering. They just are suffering with multiple systems of the body. Um, and you put them all together and then you like, look, that it also supposes that someone knows something about autism. Um, you know, if, if, if we're talking about, you know, anyone other than the stereotypical, you know, white four-year-old cis boy, um, you know, like there's all these layers for how we're not matching the pattern, even though the pattern is well established. We didn't make the pattern up. Sarah. I mean, I think there's, there's another aspect of this also that, I mean, if if I'm asking if I'm if I'm going in as an autistic person and I'm asking a doctor to stand with me in my understanding of myself and and in some ways I'm what I'm asking the doctor to do is to like there's there's the comfortable herd, there's a the comfortable herd of the medical community that the doctor can can stand with and 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 then it's like if if the doctor stands with like this weird patient who has this weird self understanding and actually takes it seriously then the doctor is at risk of of like you know the the, the rest of the medical communities you know, looking at the doctor like, like, like the rest of the world looks at me. The oblique angle to that, that I think would be a good one to wrap up on is what Zeph has in the chat right now. The best way to support my mental health and my physical health is to believe me. Right? So like, mm. like, like the oblique mm. angle is that any doctor would tell you they want to help their patient. Any doctor would tell you that. Of course, that's like why they did all this training and all the things, right? Like, uh, so, so, so now we're saying what we found in this study is that like 
widespread finding of autistic patients are feeling that they are not believed. And in fact, the best way to support help is to believe the patient. Um, it's not controversial. It's not controversial at all. It's not taking a stand, getting quackified. Like, I don't like the, the, even, you know, the most neuronormative, you know, constructs of the healthcare system. Like, nobody's going to like argue with that we should like try to help the patients and make the patients feel good. You know, like, like patients are feeling bad. It's the opposite. It's the opposite of what you think you're doing. Wow, what a what a powerful interview. Um, thank you so much. Um, I've already I, uh, I I can no longer find the slide. Hold on, I really need to do this. It's like appropriate to do this. Hold on a second. Oh man, brain, come on, I'm tired, so tired. Ah, there we go. Thank you to our panelists, Dr. Laura Lewis, Sarah Knutson, and Zeph. Um, we really appreciate all of you for um, not just sharing your um, reflections with us tonight, but all your work over the past year carrying out this study in um, such a, you know, um, I, 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 I think the significance of this study in bridging the double empathy problem to taking to, to helping professionals really understand the specific experiences of patients um, that are likely not intentional um, and 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 not like 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 and unforeseen uh, as surprising as that may be um, and I really appreciate everyone for. Um, your your comments in the chat and, and engaging in this topic, and um, it's it's um, I think the the perfect lead in to next week's webinar um, where we will be um, uh, talking about how um, parallel play with the healthcare system works here, um, and so we look forward to you all being here and uh, seeing you next Tuesday. Have a good week.